The question of the marches. Uh, I've been putting it to you that marching on Amnesty Day, I've given you all the reasons why it makes my stomach churn. But instinctively, I'm someone who believes in freedom of speech and believes that actually banning marches is something that should be taken, if at all, at the very, very last resort. However, uh, I think my principle is being tested very um, severely with the proposal to show such huge disrespect to something that matters to millions of Britons, let alone those who have been left behind in conflicts and battlefields. To help me uh, navigate this subject further, I'm very pleased to welcome a very good friend and former Member of Parliament and former Defence Minister Sir Gerald Howarth to the show. Gerald, welcome. Well, good afternoon, Nick. Well, thank you very much for joining me. It does seem strange, um, Gerald, that we've got a Prime Minister who clearly feels these marches shouldn't go ahead on Armistice Day. It looks like the head of the Met Police in his statement feels pretty much the same. And yet they are being allowed to go ahead. Is that a result of a, a natural tension between freedom of speech and the right to march and, and trying... Uh, to balance it with the deep offensiveness that these marches will cause? I like to think that it is actually the challenge that you originally set in your own mind as to your belief in uh, freedom of expression, which of course I share, and the abuse of that freedom which we are seeing uh, on our television screens weekend in, weekend out. I don't think that it is a uh, that, that our leaders are really wrestling with that issue. I think what they are doing is weighing up uh, the likely criticism from the left establishment in this country, which includes, sadly, much of the civil service uh, and indeed the police, uh, when uh, it, or if the government were to take uh, proper action, which would be to ban the march, it would be on the grounds that, uh, um, of course, that was, was racist. Uh, that's the accusation that would be levelled against the government. And I think they're absolutely petrified. Most public figures are uh, mm. petrified of being called a racist. It's the worst thing that uh, that can be called of you. And of course, the only people capable of uh, exhibiting uh, racism are uh, you and me as, as white uh, people, because uh, black people are not capable of being uh, uh, considered racist. Let me ask you one, one point of view uh, that I will adopt for the sake of argument is that they could also be weighing up the potential impact of having banned a march that people will turn up anyway and that would require forceful police action, maybe, finally, uh, and that they are therefore weighing up the risk of serious violence. Do you think that stacks up, that argument? Yes, I think, that's, I think it's an entirely fair point. And, of course, uh, because the police have been so pusillanimous up till now... Well, that, that's really important. Let's, let's just... Re I almost just want you to restate it, because I think this is a problem that the police is making. They've done nothing when people have clearly been breaking the law. It just empowers these marchers who want to hijack the march to show support for Hamas, surely. Correct. And when you see that the, the police are uh, incapable of understanding what jihad means... Um, I, uh, frankly, um, I'm not an Arabist, I don't know what uh, the technical definition of jihad is, but you and I, and countless millions of our fellow citizens brought up in this country, know what they mean by jihad, which is basically what they did on the 7th of October, uh, when Hamas uh, utterly, uh, 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 despicably murdered 1,400 Israelis in the most uh, atrocious fashion. That's what we understand jihad to mean. The Metropolitan Police don't understand that that's what it means, then they shouldn't be in the job. No, they've been pusillanimous. I mean, it, Black Lives Matter um, uh, demonstrators, you remember, we, we had police officers bending down on their knees in front of the demonstrators. But goodness sake, what on earth is going on in our country? Get a grip, uh, the police, get a grip, the government. I admire what uh, the Home Secretary said, I admire what the Prime Minister has said. They've now got to follow it up with action. And there are, uh, there are laws which are available to the Metropolitan Police uh, to enable them uh, to uh, ban the march uh, or contain it. But, you know, the, the, the natives here are pretty, pretty um, understanding. They're very tolerant, and it takes a lot to push us. But I suspect if anybody dares to insult our dead who gave their lives that we might be able to live in freedom and to express our views freely, and that those coming to our country 
electing to come to our country, enjoying those freedom, freedoms. If anybody interferes with that on Armistice Day, let alone uh, on Sunday, uh, I think there will be widespread anger and revulsion. And the police had better watch out because we it might be rather nasty. We had a former serviceman whose uh, family of lifelong servicemen and uh, had relatives who died in the Second World War, going back that far, their, their length of service. And uh, he said he was genuinely torn because he knew what this country stood for and it included the right to protest, the right to be heard. And he felt that the solution would be to allow the demonstration to go ahead but ring-fence it by a huge perimeter away from the iconic um, uh, statues, the iconic buildings, the cenotaph where the armistice um, service will be taking place. Do you, would you be optimistic that that would work? Well, I certainly think that that is a, um, a sensible option. And let's not forget there's a precedent for it because the, uh, recently... Uh, some Jewish people wanted to demonstrate about the atrocities committed uh, on the Jews in, in Israel by the terrorist organization Hamas. Uh, and they were asked by the Metropolitan Police, effectively told by the Metropolitan Police, they couldn't uh, demonstrate in central London. And they had to move their, uh, their peaceful protest up to Golders Green. Uh, so, yes, if, if, uh, if the Metropolitan Police decide for operational reasons that, that they couldn't contain um, an illegal demonstration, uh, then perhaps that is the solution, but it would have to be miles away from the Cenotaph and, and Whitehall. And Nick, I, I do think, not, not, your, uh, uh, not your or my former colleague, but Nick Timothy, who worked for Theresa May, wrote a very interesting article in the Daily Telegraph recently and said we have got to be much more muscular. And he pointed the, uh, pointed the finger at those to whom the finger needs to be pointed. These atrocities are being committed by Muslims. There are Muslim preachers in this country mm. who are supporting these atrocities, indeed glorifying in them. And we have been reluctant to speak out. If you come to this country, you enjoy freedom of worship, not something available to us in the, many of the countries from which you came. Respect our traditions, understand our traditions, and recognize that if you come to this country, or you were brought up in, the, in, in this country by parents who themselves elected to come to this country, then do not insult us and recognize uh, that uh, you enjoy the freedom to worship in this country, but you do not enjoy uh, the right to be able to tell us what to do, to hold us to ransom, to demonstrate in our streets, to defile our buildings, and to behave in the manner in which so many are behaving. And I do urge the Muslim leaders, they have got to speak out and denounce those in amongst them who rejoice in what uh, what Hamas did and those atrocities on the 7th of October, because it was absolutely, utterly disgusting. And if, if these demonstrations have served to embolden the British people to speak out and say, this is something up with which we will no longer put, then perhaps something will, good will come out of it. But we've got to stop being scared of saying that it is one particular community who are doing this. Interestingly, uh, I, uh, I checked up on this, but the one of the people calling for Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the opposition, to resign is the leader of Burnley Council. Uh, and I heard, I don't know if it was him, he's called Councillor Anwar, uh, I don't know if it was him, but I heard other council leaders and Labour councillors who said that they were going to uh, possibly resigned when they probably called on Sir Keir Starmer to resign as leader because they were representing the concerns of their communities. What they meant by their communities were not the people in their constituencies. They were one community, the Muslim community. And interestingly, in Burnley, where the, the mayor is uh, Asian, the leader is Asian, and it seems the chief executive is Asian, they have 87.5% 87, 87 of the population is white. 10% is Pakistani. 17.5% say they're non-British. Uh, forgive me, um, but you do not speak just for one small part of your community. You should be speaking for all your community. And all your community will be just 
has riven with with, with, with concern and uh, and passion, as all of us are, seeing the unfolding tragedy in the Middle East, and recognizing there is no easy solution. When you when you um, bring in, you mentioned the Labour Party politics that's come into this situation. Are politicians, and, and I think on both sides, but vastly more obvious and, and, and to a greater degree on the Labour side, are politicians as guilty of, if you like, achieve, of, of creating, of being part of the problem by seeing things in terms of block votes, which I'm not a great fan of and don't necessarily believe, by, by respond, even having the conversation about what has been got, what went on four weeks ago in Israel and now what is going on in Gaza through the lens of how many votes it might cost them or not. Isn't that part of the problem? I think it's part of the problem, but fortunately uh, th th there aren't all that many constituencies in the United Kingdom uh, which mm. uh, are susceptible to that sort of uh, pressure. Of course, it's very much part of the politics of uh, the United States of America, where uh, the, the, um, those standing for election have to appeal to this lobby, that lobby, and the other lobby. And, uh, of course, I think that's a big mistake. I happened to work for a bank called European Arab Bank uh, when I was uh, uh, putting my name forward to be the candidate at South End East in succession uh, to Stephen McCadden, who had uh, had died. There was a by-election, and uh, I got to the final three. Teddy Taylor got the, got through, but I was in the final three. And some, somebody said, so, Mr. Howard, how do you uh, uh, reconcile them? Um, how are you going to appeal uh, to the uh, the Jewish folks? in South End, if you work for European Arab Bank. I said, I'm not going to appeal to the Jewish vote, the Arab vote, or any other vote. The only vote I'm going to appeal to is the British vote. And that is what our people do need to understand. And if I could just say there were some very bold people in the Labour Party, one of them is Sarah Champion. Sarah Champion got sacked from the front bench by Jeremy Corbyn because she spoke out about what was going on in Rotherham, where gangs of Asians were were committing the most disgusting crimes Grooming against crimes. white yes. girls. But nobody would talk about it, least of all the police, because they were afraid. They were afraid, what, afraid of being knifed? Not afraid of being knifed. They were afraid of being criticised for criticising one particular community who had this dispensation, uh, who had this, sorry, this predilection uh, to go after young, specifically young white girls. We have got to call it out, Nick, for what it is because otherwise we are going to lose all the great values that this nation stands for, because we're going to be overwhelmed by an alien tradition, an alien culture, which is not part of the way most of the people in the United Kingdom wish to go. Sir Gerald Howe, thank you very much for speaking your mind, speaking candidly, uh, very refreshing to hear. We're very pleased to have you on the programme. Thank you very much indeed. And